What's up, guys? It's Justin Kahn, and you're listening to The Quest, my podcast where I dive deep into the ups and downs of the people around me. And today, my guest is my friend Arlen Hamilton. Arlen is one of the most inspirational people with one of the most inspirational stories of anyone I've ever met. Five years ago, Arlen was a music tour manager doing large-scale arena tours, and she decided she wanted to be a tech venture capitalist. And she really decided that she was going to become one no matter what. After numerous rejections from VC firms, spending years trying to find her first investor, and a thorough lack of connections in the industry, while she even spent time homeless and living out at the airport in San Francisco, she made her goal happen. And today she's the founder of Backstage Capital, a venture firm that's funded over 150 companies. She's an incredibly determined and resilient person. And in our conversation, we discuss stories from her new book, It's About Damn Time. We talk about Backstage Capital and her mission to fund underrepresented founders, being persistent, what she's learned from being an investor in over 150 tech companies, overcoming her addiction to alcohol, and much more. I hope you enjoy this conversation with my friend Arlen. So Arlen, thanks for joining me today. I'm super excited to to um, talk to you. You know, we've been friends for a little bit and I've been a fan for a, for a while. And this podcast that I'm creating is really about telling people's stories and really trying to help people understand that everybody has the ups and downs of life that, you know, and, and their experiences are not, not unique. I think for me, a lot of a lot of the time I looked at people when I was coming up a lot, I looked at people who were successful and I was like, oh man, if I could just get to there, then all my problems would be solved. You know, and part of the goal here is to just show people it's not always like that. I've been spending a lot of time listening to your audio book recently or book, reading the book, I guess. Do we, do we call it reading anymore if I listen to it? I call it reading. Right. I call it reading. Then I'm an avid reader and I, I was uh, listening to your book and I was really excited about uh, talking about some of the stuff in it. So. Maybe yeah, just to be to. to begin, I, I'd love to hear you tell in your own words the story about how you became the manager for Golden Boy. Because I thought <laughs> that was like the funniest and most amazing thing, you know, kind of to set the stage. Yeah, that <laughs> well, it was almost I mean, man, it's almost 20 years ago. It was 19 years ago. That's so trippy to me. So it's half my life ago. I was working in Dallas, Texas, which is where I grew up. And I was working at a bank. So I was working at like a 10 key. I was doing 10 key by touch data entry, which meant one hand, my right hand just typing for eight hours straight really fast while my left hand dropped checks into an encoding machine. And so it should the, the encoding should match the actual uh, total of the check. So I'd have to I'd get like a thousand checks wrapped up in a rubber band and I would just like super fast drop the check matched the, the amount and it would get encoded so they could go and be deposited into a bank. And so I did that and I got really good at it, but it was like, it was so monotonous and so like soul crushing. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. you, you know what I mean? Like it was like, yeah. like I would, I would get, I would be like one of the top performers and you'd get your name on like a board and I would just look at the board and I would just be like, it was like a, a movie scene or something. It was like, Oh God. Why am I like, I didn't want to be good at it. You know what I mean? It was yeah. just like soul crushing. But anyway, it was, it was a gig and, and, and any gig, I could, any gig I could get back then was really, I was grateful for. So I was just turned 21. I was at that gig and I was just like trying to just pass the time. So I was listening to this music and um, came across this, this song. It was really a cute song about the singer Pink. And I liked Pink at the time. Like I still do. I love her music. So it was this pop punk band from Norway. And I had never heard of them. I don't know exactly where the song came from. I just thought it was really nice. And anyway, I, I got in touch with them because I was just bored. And I said, hey, I want to see you perform. They said, hey, we're in Norway. And I said, well, <laughs> can, I book, can I book a tour for you? And if I book a tour for you, will you come here? Because I couldn't just book a show because I, they wouldn't come here for a show. But they were like, sure. Like we've tried to, we've booked a couple of shows there before. It's really hard to do. And it's a big deal. So if you can book a tour, yeah, we'll, we'll find a way to come out there. So I just taught myself how to book a tour across the country. And, you know, I wasn't Googling anything at that time. I wasn't on like, I was, I think I was using MapQuest. I think that's what yes, it was. Yes, MapQuest. And, and like printing it out. 
Yep. And so I just like from scratch just had all these folders for each city and just started making phone calls. And every time I'd make a phone call, I would learn a little bit more about the jargon or the, the, the process. And so it was a few things I was figuring out at the same time. One being that they had no name here. Like they were a garage band from Bergen, Norway. And, you know, they're going to play in front of maybe 20 people if we were lucky. But I figured figured it out. And over a couple of months, I ended up booking them five week tour, I think it was for the first time. And then the second time, I, uh, second summer, I booked them another tour across the country and I went on the road with them. And so I became everything, anything that wasn't on the stage, I was doing, <laughs> basically, <laughs> uh, including babysitter. They must have been amazed when, you know, that you called them and were like, hey, can you come here? I'm a fan and I want to see you play. And then they were like, OK, if you book a tour, we'll come. And then you come back to yeah. them and you're like, hey, here's the tour. I think they were. I mean, they were they were so excited. I can still see them walking in the in the Dallas the DFW airport. I can still see them like when you know you have to watch them from watch them walk out to the baggage claim and they have to go through that international <laughs> thing. I can still they were so excited and there happened to be someone there wearing a cowboy hat, which is not really what Dallas is like, but they were just like it's we're in America and it's cowboys and they were just so stoked to be there and they're like all of them I think I was the youngest one of them so they they just truly were living out a teenage dream of being able to be on a, a rock tour in the U.S. even though it was the most indie operation you could imagine it was just a dream for them and people thought I was crazy you know <laughs> like these five Norwegian guys just show up and we go out on the road in a van basically <laughs> it was just kind of nuts and that was the start of, you know, eventually you, you continued on to, to work in music and did shows and, and book sh tours for indie artists and then eventually went to, to big arena artists. Did you think that that was going to be a career for you or how did, how did you turn that into, you know, continuing going in music? Yeah, I definitely, it wasn't as random as I, as it may seem because I, since I was 13, I had wanted to work in live music. So I went to see Janet Jackson as my first concert, and that's a whole story in itself, but I got to see her in the front row through a, a series of very fortuitous events. And that night, so much changed for me. And that too, I can remember as clear as day, which was that turning around and looking at that audience that was so diverse and so energetic and so palpable, the energy and just saying, I don't know what this is, but it was felt like a drug to me. You know, what 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 I would imagine a drug would feel like. It felt like a, this high. And I said, I don't know what this is, but I want to experience this as a job. And I knew I wasn't going to be on a stage like singing or dancing or anything like that. That wasn't really exciting to me. But I said, well, look at all these people who, who are working behind the scenes. I could probably figure out how to do whatever they're doing. And so it had always been a dream of mine. And so even though, yeah, I, I worked on the, the Golden Boy tour. I did a few other indie tours for singer-songwriters mostly, which were big – I mean, it was a big production to get those booked. It was a lot of work. But they were, again, indie shows, mostly you know, 20 to 200 people at any given show. And then a few years went by, and I did all the things in between, including starting a print magazine. And – after that, after I lost the magazine, which we can certainly talk about, I said, I want to go back. I want to go on the road again, but I want to, I have to do it as a career. It can't be like a hobby because I'm like late 20s now. So it can't be just me bumming around with these Norwegian guys. That's when I just really got intentional about it. And I reached out to a hundred tour managers and production managers who I researched over a couple of months online. The, the search was more sophisticated at this point. Things were more accessible at this point. We were just getting into Facebook and, and all of that was getting really, you know, coming to coming to light. So I used that to get myself. Tw I had 20 responses from the 100. I got three in-person meetings. And then one of those meetings turned into a, a, my first paying arena level gig. Wow. So I want to, there's so much in there I want to talk about, but I want to go back to something, I guess that's been consistent in, in your story, which is the confidence to just get in there and learn. 
when it you know came to booking shows for Golden Boy, you were cold calling venues and saying, "Hey, I want to book a show," and then learning the lingo and how to do it while you were you know kind of doing it live the first time, and then you know cold calling the managers. I think you tell that story in your book, cold emailing a hundred managers and getting all the way down to to eventually get one job. How did you develop that confidence to just dive into things that you don't didn't know? You know, I thinking back to when I was. 19 years old or 18 years old or even in my early 20s imagining cold calling a bunch of random venues to try to book a, a band that no one had ever heard of i would be deathly afraid of that i would never be able to do that i'm curious where that came from for you it probably came from a few places i i definitely just had a confidence and that not to say that i was overly confident or like super egotistical ever but I definitely had a sense of self that came was derived from my mother and the people, this very strong women around me that I grew up with. It was just in the, in the strong black people that I grew up with. Like I saw myself not reflected in media well, but I saw myself reflected in the actual people I was around. And that just told me, I just, it's, it was never a question to me that we were valuable. I was valuable. What I had to say was of value. And it was really up to me to study and get better at things and to kind of level up. Now, this was before I w went further out into the real world where a lot of things were became kind of clear to me that there were some inequalities and things were unfair. But like, I just felt like anybody who was who didn't think that I should be in the room was, was odd. They were the ones who were like, should we get them some help? Are they okay? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, I think it came from that. And I just think it came from also, we had very little money when I was growing up and we always just had to figure stuff out. Like I was, since I was probably eight or nine, I was babysitting my younger brother alone and you just kind of figure stuff out. You know, there was no babysitter. There was no, there was no like someone coming to save you. And I was essentially a second parent to my, you know, starting at probably 10 or 12 with my mom. And we were the, we were leading the household. And so if things had to get figured out, you figured them out. And so I started working at 15. And to me, it was like, this is what you do. You know, you think about a lot of people who like grow up on farms or things like that. And they're, I don't know why I'm going here with it, but it just kind of came to mind. Like they grow up in a certain situation and they're just like, this is what you do. This is. It, it it may seem strange to other people, but these were, this is the tools. These are the tools that I needed in order to survive early on. So it stands to reason that I'm going to bring them into my adult life. And that can be negative and that can be positive. So it sounds like that built a lot of resilience, even though at the time it might have been difficult. Those, those are the experiences that built resilience later on, which I think, you know, through your story, you really demonstrate time and time again. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely believe so. I believe that's where it started. And then the funny, the funny thing is the, the Ataris, was it the Ataris that said it, they were right. Uh, that the being grown up isn't half as fun as growing up. <laughs> yeah. So if, uh, you do learn a lot more, the more you go. So I'd love to talk about that, the magazine and like you had a business, you built the business and maybe you could tell us about, about the magazine and then also about losing it and what that experience was like. Yeah. So I was living in, in Mira Mesa, which is uh, such, uh, I hate the way I say it, because <laughs> it's Mira Mesa, but I was living there just north of San, San Diego at age 23, I think. I had I had gone there for, uh, who was like uh, one of my, like my first adult girlfriend, you know, my first adult relationship. I had gone from Texas there, didn't work out. Talk, talk a lot about that in the, I mean, talk a bit about that in the book and, and the, the silliness. It involves an IHOP. So, you know, <laughs> you check it out. But I was living there and I just remember walking into my roommate's, Shana's room one day and just saying, I want to start a magazine. <laughs> and this was post Golden Boy. Yep. So having had those experiences on the road and seeing all different types of music and like the indie scene and all of that, I just was, I had been so used to seeing very produced, highly produced concerts, the Janet Jacksons and the, and the InSync's of the world and the voice to men, all of like this R and B pop world. And I loved it. And I also had just incredibly diverse musical tastes. And then to see the indie world, 
and to be exposed to Warped Tour. That was a big part of it too, where I did like a video interview with, I had a video interview with Sugar Cult and a few other people, right? And so I just was always curious. So I did these little interviews. And so I was just like, I have all this running around in my head, but anytime I talk to someone, no one really has that same musical taste. Everybody is just like, when I look at magazines, it's just like, oh, this is the rock magazine, or this is the R&B magazine, or this is whatever. And I'm like, what if there were a magazine that I could read that had Jewel and um, and Garbage and also Babyface, <laughs> you yeah. know, hot talked about, but also my brother, uh, Rook, who was a rapper in Dallas at the time, what if he could pick up the same magazine and he saw something that he liked? And so he saw something he recognized and it's something that opened up his mind. And I saw something I recognized and something that opened up my mind. And so I just dreamed of that type of magazine that I just couldn't find. And on top of that, I just had seen so many European magazines and I thought they were just uh, really superior to a lot of the U.S. magazines, just in their paper and their the paper stock and then their reporting and a lot of things. So anyway, I I just had this image of a very well-produced indie magazine that was sort of a contradiction of itself. Mm-hmm. My th- thinking of it was just because something is independent and just because something is alt, it doesn't have to like sacrifice the quality. And in fact, it can be a luxury version for people. And I don't know exactly where all that came from in my mind. It just was there. And I had never worked in a magazine. I had never um, done anything, you know, in a corporate setting like that. But I knew I wanted a magazine. So I set out to start a magazine. (laughs) So I, again, a little bit of it's in the book, but like just essentially just reached out to people and started. I I, I was putting together a, a startup without knowing it. I didn't yeah. just know the jargon. I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I reached out to some people. I did a lot of the stuff, my, like all the interviews and everything. And then I had this idea. I'm like, well, Interview Magazine, they have people interviewing each other. And that's really intriguing. And that, that'll take away some of my work if I just have to transcribe <laughs> it. So I started getting people to interview each other. So I had like, uh, I believe it was Marco from Sugar Cult interviewed Mike from All American Rejects. And that was like a real – and it might have been – it was somebody from – What's I'm not okay. My Chemical Romance was, and they were, and it was really interesting. Like they were talking to each other, and they hadn't, even though they had been on the road together. You talk about like learning about each other. They had been on the road together with these bands, but because it was such pomp and circumstance, and like you're supposed to be this rock band and this other rock band, they had never really talked to each other. So yeah, on the, they- I remember being on the phone when. It was a guy from My Chemical Romance. It might have even been Gerard. I can't remember it, like, these days. It's been 15 years plus. But it was somebody from My Chemical, and it was Mike from All, All American Rejects. And they were just talking about both of their drug use, the previous drug use, and how they were trying to get better. And it was just so touching. And yeah. I don't know if you could have had that or expected that of the next indie magazine at the time or even the, the mid-level magazine. And so there's a lot of magic that happened. At the same time, we had people like Tyler Hilton and Johnny Lang talking to each other. And it was just like this pop world guy from One Tree Hill talking to like a, a guitar rock god, uh, you know, but blues god, right? And it, it was just such an eclectic magazine. And I loved every minute of it. And I was able to like you know Kip Dynamite from from Napoleon Dynamite, the guy that played the brother yeah. that loves technology. Yeah. yeah, uh, he was at the time he was just like this incredible photographer that nobody knew about, and he let me put all his like a lot of his photography in our book as like a as like a walking like a, you could carry around his his sort of exhibit, and it was just really beautiful and magical in a lot of ways. It also kicked my butt financially it absolutely kicked my butt mentally emotionally um kicked me all <laughs> sideways and left ways for about 5 years wouldn't change a thing even though it was like really tough and i learned so much and was exposed to so much talent and i think it really developed my chops when it when it comes to like taking a hit and also that resilience was just off the charts after that and of course that's been helpful now but when it was happening like we had this what was that 
thing called? I forgot. It was. It's so funny. At the moment, it's like the biggest thing in the world, and I can't even remember the name of it. Pure volume. <laughs> pure volume. Does anybody remember pure volume? Back when MySpace was just getting into having music on their on your pages. They didn't have music on their pages at first. And then they had yep. that little plug in and everybody had their music on their page and it was huge. There was this other site called Pure Volume that you would go to and listen for every genre you could think of and see what was trending that day. And the huh. uh Brett, the Watunsky, I think is his last name, he he saw my magazine because it was in hot topic. Yeah. He got it into Hot Topic stores. This was just a beautiful, beautifully shot magazine as well with the amazing photographer named Leanne. And he had seen it and he was like, I want to acquire this because I think it'd be amazing. You know, I think it was like a beautiful shot of All American Rejects on the cover. And I think he was like, this is amazing. And he called me and he was like, tell me about your team. Tell me about your setup. Where's your office? <laughs> like, well, I'm in a two bedroom apartment in El Cajon. There are gunshots every night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I've, uh, you know, barely met the people I work with uh, and they're all freelance and we have no money whatsoever. And he's like, that's impossible. But he was like, okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get you a salary because the editor of a magazine like this needs to have a salary. And I was like, that's amazing. That's cool. And we started working on a deal and he was going to acquire Interlude Magazine, the magazine that I had spent, you know, the, the past year or so at this point on. And then I get a call or an email, and luckily for him, Pure Volume itself was being acquired. But oh. that meant our deal fell through because they didn't want they didn't the people who were acquiring it didn't it was a digital all digital platform, so they didn't need it. And it was like he was really apologetic, and he tried to help me out, you know, a little bit. But it was like it was pretty. If you're talking about like those knockdowns, that was a major one. Yeah. So I so I did a few issues there and then I took a, a break because I just couldn't afford to keep it going. And then I brought it back a couple of years later. And this time when I brought it back, I had been running a blog called Your Daily Lesbian Moment for however long. And it was being viewed by 50,000 people a month religiously, like yep. a daily platform, uniques. And so when I came back with the magazine, it was now interlude for chicks who like chicks. That was the byline. And it was the same high quality, the same kind of idea of interviewing each other. But it was now people like Margaret Cho on the cover. It was people like Tegan and Sarah, Missy Higgins, who had just come out. She had just come out in Australia. She was like Australia's Sarah McLaughlin, if anybody's old enough to know who that is, who's listening to this. I've lost half of the guys who listen to this, by the way, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, but she was like a major star. She she was like the, probably the most famous musician in Australia at the time she came out as bi. And, yeah. I, and I got her um, interview. I grabbed her interview right after that. So it was that the whole iteration of it was really special as well and just really beautifully executed and then of course 2008 hit and 2008 yeah. was was a killer year and not in a good way and I just I lost the magazine again and the, the thing is though when I lost it I had no idea of the of the macro I had yeah. no idea that ev that it was a it was a, the, the year that it was all I knew was that Obama needed to be president because I liked this guy and that I didn't have any money and that I had to lose my magazine. I had no idea that, you know, what would follow would be Vibe magazine going under and this magazine going under and that magazine going under and having to be saved. But at the time, I thought, you failed. Your failure. Right, you put it all in your shoulders. Yeah, it was, oh, it was big time, big time. So it's like, it's really a testament now. Like, I do not let current, quote unquote, failures, I don't even know how to call them failures at this, at this point. I don't let them get to me because I understand when you pull back the lens now, what that hindsight is. And can you, I mean, just being in that and just thinking, oh, you're just not good at this. And, and now I'm thinking like, now people... Now it's written in a book that is, you know, has a major book deal by, you know, one of the biggest publishers in the world. But at the time it was, and like people use it as like uh, inspiration. At the time it just felt so 
isolated. And I just think so many people probably listening to your podcast, they're they're what you bring to it is just hey, you know, if if the if someone like you who is one of the supermen of Silicon Valley can be vulnerable and say, look, it's not all it's not all perfect. You know, there's these ups and downs. Then I think it's just such a lesson that people should take in. And I just listen to it as like, oh, this is something nice to listen to. And that's their experience. So really take it in. Yeah. Because it's so true. All your favorites are going through something. Yeah. That that old quote that every person is fighting their own secret war you know nothing about. You know, I find that really applies. And every time I talk to someone successful, famous, whatever it is, they've gone through their own personal struggles and and dark times. And I think there's something you said in there that really resonated with me, which was really around, you know, the amount that you can internalize failure and the, you can, it's really easy to carry that all on your shoulders and to, to feel I failed, I didn't make it and know nothing about how much externalities and how much macro and luck and timing and all the things you can't control go into someone's success. I think in your book, you say that you don't believe in saying you're a self-made person, right? Like a self-made man, self-made woman, because nobody's self-made, right? Like everybody is the product of both their internal, but their external. But so often we're in these situations where we feel like we had control. I had to control the outcome and I failed and I didn't make it. And that can be an incredible weight to, to carry a, a burden that's that's unfair in so many ways. And for me, I think it was interesting. I had those experiences all the way beyond being successful, you know, even through my last company, which failed after we raised a lot of money. And so, you know, I had those experiences, but through the process of a lot of self-work and self-reflection I've, I've done and just being able to be more kind to myself and say, you know, part of it wasn't under my control and part of my circumstances not, that's been a huge like life changer to me more than any external change has been, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it comes, it comes with age, but look, you, you have these breadcrumbs that are left for you. So anyone who's listening, who's like 16 to 30, what a gift to, to have all these podcasts and all these books you could read and, and learn so much so quickly. And anyone who's uh, 31 to to a hundred <laughs> listening, what a, what a, inspiration to kind of kind of pick yourself back up and start over so i'd love to fast forward a little bit and segue to what you're doing now and backstage capital and i know a lot of people out there probably have heard the story of how you started it and you've told it a million times so maybe you could just give a brief overview of how you came to start backstage how you knew you wanted to be a vc and then you know, kind of what the mission of Backstage is, which I'm particularly interested in. Yeah, I I had gone through the the tour managing stuff uh, <laughs> and the and the production assistance uh, production coordinator at this point stuff. I had then started the magazine, quit the magazine, started it again, and then I got the arena level with the music, and I had reached a dream of mine, but I was still really broke. <laughs> It wasn't making any money. Like you make good money on the road, but you're only on the road, what, two months total of a year or something like that. It's just crazy. And there's no health insurance. There's no, none of that. So I had been, while on and off the road, I had a couple of things going on. One was that I was just seeing so many people in the entertainment world, the managers, people actually have money in entertainment. The artists themselves, some of them have money, but most of them is hand to mouth, right? Yeah. But like the the managers and the label people, those people who are, who have the big homes and make the most money off of, of things, they were making investments in Silicon Valley and they were making investments in things like a Twitch or in things like a Y Combinator. I remember like seeing Ashton Kutcher do a, an interview and he had Airbnb sticker, an Airbnb sticker on his laptop. And I was like, why does he, what is he doing that? He had these stickers on his laptop, which I think he then had to remove because it was like, he, he got in trouble for doing it on TV, but um, I was like, so I started like just being really curious, like why, why are these celebrities? Why are these ma money managers? What are they seeing in Silicon Valley? Cause you know, you can think you can do like a thread, a, a through line through my whole life has always been like, like extreme curiosity and also like observation and following 
not necessarily looking for trends because it's like if it's a trend, it's too late. It's already it's already hit, right? But like looking at the the beginning of the wave so that you can catch it, you you have it, you know. So I was just like, what is going on? And it's not like that was when everything started, you know, in Silicon Valley, but it was certainly like people I was talking to didn't know anything about it. It was still like a, a well-kept open secret yep. that you could make these investments. And so I just started getting really curious about the world and, and I started researching like mad and watching interviews and finding out who all these different people were. And I was like, cool, this, you know, I, I just described to you a life that's very eclectic. And so I had been around so many different types of people. So to me, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to walk into Silicon Valley and they're going to accept me just like these guys on the road did, this Norwegian pop punk band did, you know, it's like my race and my gender are not going to have anything to do with it. But that myth was busted <laughs> when I started really digging. And I said, wait a second, this is um, like... I would love to be welcomed here. Not only welcome, but like dominate here. Like I would love to just have this playground that it seems like this is for all these guys. And yeah, I was used to in the past having to muscle my way in. If there was a bunch of dudes, you know, of any race, whatever, I just like, okay, there's a bunch of dudes here. I'm just going to speak up louder and they'll listen to me and they'll respect me. I was used to that in different places. But what I was figuring out here was that it was so Silicon Valley and beyond were so systemically and also, like, precisely and almost by design, it looked like it was built for very specific people to shine and to thrive. And not to mention, it doesn't mean that if you walked in as a straight white man, for instance, who was affluent and got $10 million in year one, it didn't mean that whole organization would still love you year three. It was like this, right. there was like this machine that was built to fold you in and use you and then crush you. <laughs> I don't know, it sounds so bad, but it's just, it's from the outside, it just looks so, it was like so designed for, to, to just make the very specific people very, very rich and very powerful. And everybody else was like a cog. Everybody else was like a, a means to an end. And the, and the people who were getting the crumbs of all of that, that sort of ecosystem, were then black people, were then women, were then the people who were just being sort of in the bigger picture of the United States who are who are normally left out of things. So I saw all of that. I don't, you know, as I was as I was looking through my interviews and and just listening to what people were saying and reading books, and I said, "Wow, okay." So I have two options, really. One option is, well, actually three. One option is I can be really upset about this, really pissed, frustrated, et cetera. And I can just like give up and say, I'm not going to even go in that world. Who wants to be in that world anyway? F it. And I'll go and do this other music stuff and just dial in. A, a second option was I could like learn everything I can and hack the system. And I can figure out how to be that one, you know, even call it token, if you will, be that one out of a few who gets in. And gets the investment and gets in on the cool kids table and uh, and is acceptable to the system and doesn't get spat out. Yep. And then the third one was F both of those and I can use that same skill for number two and like bring everybody with me. And that's what I decided to do. There is a way to hack this because we're dealing with people at the end of the day. Right. And once, once you decided, that's what, you know, you learned about VC, you decided that's what you were going to do. How did you go about taking those first few steps? The first steps were in the research. I mean, that's like yeah. the most important part, really, in that research and development stage, I guess. Then I just started reaching out to people because I did think it was going to be a little bit easier than it ended up being. So I started reaching out to people and I was like, hey, I came across this thing. Did you know that there's bias at Silicon Valley? And then people were like, ah, uh, yeah, shh. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk about that <laughs> I was like oh because I was like of course they'll be like uh, they'll they'll be happy to le have learned this And but it's like so many people already knew but it was like swept under the rug so I did a lot of outreach I put together some really really not great decks <laughs> proposals some really very not great emails that were too long and, and, and ridiculous that I will like scroll by if I see in my inbox these days. 
And I just started talking to people and I started making myself available to people like mostly. So I, instead of like going after the people who had money and the people who had the power, I tried that for a while and it wasn't, I wasn't getting anywhere. So I just said, well, let me do the opposite. Let me just go to only the, like mostly the people who want to break in because that, yeah. you know, get it from that angle. And so I just started talking to all these founders and getting their takes on things and kind of interviewing them basically without interviewing them and saying, what is your, you know, greatest need? What is your biggest pain point? How can I be helpful? But also like, I'm just collecting that information too. And that's when I was able to talk to like dozens and dozens of founders of different companies from all backgrounds and start to really put together a pattern and say, wow, this is not anybody's imagination. This is really happening. And people are writing about it for sure. People are talking about it, but they weren't, in my opinion, they weren't acting on it in such an audacious way that it would move the needle enough. And so I just started putting together this plan of, I'm going to raise some money. I'm going to raise money. Like the same way I was going to try to raise money for a company because I wanted to start a company. Yeah. I'm going to raise money for a fund that invests in other companies. I started putting this plan together. Okay, I'm going to raise a million dollars. Then it was like, I'm going to raise 20 million. And it was like, whatever, you know, kind of every single day I'd work on something. And at the very beginning, something people, very few people know, is at the very beginning of that, I linked up with two white men who had been successful funders in Europe. I don't talk to them now, so they're nobody you've seen me talk to, so don't try to guess, right? But I had okay. had linked up with them because I thought, hey, I just need a I need a way in. I need a Trojan horse, you know? Yep. These guys will walk me in the room and, and it'll be fine. And they kind of got what I was talking about and it was like gonna be it was gonna be cool. We're gonna share all the the financial terms and all that, the economics. And we have our first call, first phone call for this meeting. And I have it in a rental car because I don't, I'm like sleeping out of a a hotel with my mom sharing a room at this point, no money. They have money. So they're going to put the office together and like pay me and we're going to go. And I'm in the car and we have our first call and they, and I'm like, I put this together. It was my thesis. It was me bringing the two of them together who didn't know each other. It was all of this. Our very first call, they just like, just completely bulldoze me. They talk over me. They don't take anything I have to say at face value. It's completely like, oh, this is going to (laughs) suck. So as much as I hated it and as much as, again, I needed that capital because I was in a personal issue in in straits, I, I, I wrote to them afterwards and I said, as much as I would love this to work, it's not going to work. I can already tell it's not going to work. And I will. So it's, it's another, you know, it's another thing of like looking down the barrel of having the capital that I thought was going to save me and then having to say no to it. Okay. So can you tell us about how you got to the place where you made your first investment and like, how do you got the money? How you got you know, the very first start? Yeah, I had been working on the fund fundraising for several years, three years maybe more. And I saw that there was a a course that was happening at Stanford. That's like a two week boot camp that 500 startups was putting on. And I just, it's a longer story, but I got myself there. (laughs) And Chris Saka actually was the first, I did a crowdfund and he didn't really know me very well. Like he didn't know me from Adam, but I had been introduced to him on email and he put in the first 500 for this 3000 crowdfund even though the course was like 10 grand for uh, at a discount or something. But he put that first 500 in, which was like a big boost to my confidence. And then I went to this course for two weeks at Stanford, 500 startups. I, I had a lot of fun there. It was really exciting. I met someone named Susan Kimberlin, who was an angel investor there. And um, I'm a little, I'm a little torn anytime I talk about that time. You know, I don't, I don't mind it being in this podcast. However, if you want it to be, I don't mind it at all. But I was pretty bummed because early on, I, I I just really liked Dave McClure. You know, he was teaching that course yeah. and he was so friendly and like, you know, looking back, um, it was just a real bummer to hear about all of the stuff that he, the situations he put himself into and the mistakes he made. And so it's, it's like a bittersweet time yeah, to think about. But in that course, I met Susan and over, let's see, June, July, August, about four months over a four-month period, 
we talked a lot and got to know each other remotely. And I was going through a lot of stuff personally during that time, but she didn't know about it. And so, because I didn't want her to like make an investment decision based on like my personal issues. And in September, she's like, I'm going to, I'm going to invest, I'm going to invest in you. So like, you know, it started in May and it was this long conversation, but in September she's like, I'm going to invest. And so she put in 25K for me to make an investment in somebody. And then she gave yeah. me another 25K to build my office. So I didn't have to like sleep at the airport and be, never know if I was going to eat literally that day. Yeah. And so she, again, she did not know that. And so I had been so disciplined and so prepared and preparing for this moment that I was meticulous in my spending. I was incredibly organized and disciplined in my spending. And so I was able to really stretch that in a way that most people wouldn't, I don't think would have been able to do, but I didn't want to ever be back in the situation. So I was like, I don't know when the next tranche is going to come in ever. So I'm going to be really smart about this. So I made my first investment. She also introduced me to the next, she introduced me to Jocelyn Goldfine who was at the, uh, had just left Facebook as an engineering director, and she was an angel. And so now she works at Zeta Ventures, which is like a $400 million B2B SaaS fund. And at the time, though, she hadn't started that, and she was an angel investor. And so she put in capital. And then Jocelyn introduced me to Lars Rasmussen, who started Google Maps. And yep. he put in money with his partner, Elamita. And so it was like a little bit of, it wasn't really fast. People think of it like they think, I was like, oh, you started and then you just got all this money right away, like back to back. There would be days, weeks, or even months in between. But it was, it was all I had said the whole time was if one person believes in me enough to invest, I got it from here. All I need is one person and I just meant it. And so I just took that and made some investments because I had been working with these companies for so long. Some of them were great investments and still work today. And some of them were not great investments because I've learned over time and kept going and started putting a team together uh, slowly but surely. So those early founders, before you, you were talking to them when you didn't have any capital as part of your interview process of like learning about the industry. And then how did you sell them on, hey, you should take my money and let me be part of your journey? What was the story there? So I invested in women, people of color, and LGBTQ founders. And then in 2015 and 16, they didn't have other options. They didn't even have a friends and family around to speak of. There was just no, any friends and family who wanted to wouldn't have been able to for most of the people that I was investing in. So it wasn't, a, it, I had already convinced them, telling them my vision before I had any money. I already said, look, what if I could, find a way to, to raise money. And it wasn't going to be a lot compared to what you, you know, are used to, like used to seeing or would need, but it would be paired with all the stuff that I'm doing for free right now that you already see that I, I'm so passionate about this. And I, and I'll make as many phone calls as I need and connect you as much as I can because I was building a network the whole time. And I'll be that call you can make. And so for, for some of it, like people would take my 25K in like a million dollar round. But I would maybe be the very first check yeah. and then they would take that to go or check this out. Like sometimes I would get into rounds and they would come together and like the, the round would come together, or, you know, in these certain cases and they would have like top tier funds on their cap table. They would have a board in some cases. We put in 25K of maybe 2 million or 3 million. We would still be the first phone call they made for a lot of these companies. They would say like, hey, I'm going through something right now. I can't talk to my board about it. Like, how should I, how should I tell them? And I was just, I was just blown away by that. Cause I was like, these people put in like a million dollars each or something and they're on your board. And we're, we're like in for a tiny bit, even if you're a rocket ship, right. Yeah. But you, you come to us first and then we would kind of, I or somebody on the team or together, we would just like work workshop some stuff with them. So I think it wasn't like convincing when they say deal flow is king, the, the backstage is royalty. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Because our deal flow is insane and always has been from day one. People were coming to us in droves because we represented something they had not seen before. We And all that research I did before to say, I'm not building something and hoping somebody will need it or want it and have to convince anybody. I'm building based on what I'm hearing. 
People need these top three things. So I'm going to go after that. They need the capital. They need that confidence and they need connections. And I'm going to just dial into that and be the best I can at that. And a lot of it too is like figuring out how to talk to other investors and say, can my stamp of approval somehow become some sort of currency for you and help you with your diligence? And so like, just like with Y Combinator, if you see a YC company, people already automatically think it's great because they know the diligence that it had to go through to go through it. And then also the extra stuff that it gets. So can my name mean that? And that's what I started working on early too. Yeah. It reminds me a lot about YC in a way, because when Paul, you know, and I know you guys have had your differences online, but well, we certainly do. One, one thing that I think he, <laughs> he, he did in the very beginning was fish in a pond that people weren't looking at in that very beginning in 2005, mm-hmm. which was mm-hmm. young kids who had no idea what they were doing. And they were just like, okay, let's just start something. And I remember the prevailing wisdom in Silicon Valley at the time was, well, there's only 10 companies that get started that matter. So you can't create any more. We're just like, as a VC, you're competing for those 10 companies. You know, yep. like you yep. could imagine what those, you know, those are founders pedigreed. They came from Google or, you know, Facebook wasn't around at the time, but came from some other Silicon Valley company. And they yeah, looked Microsoft, like- Microsoft, Intel. Exactly. That kind of thing, and then yes. they were going to start a new company and the cycle continues in kind of like the same networks. And Paul was like, okay, we're going to fund these early stage companies that have no, no, you know, experience. They're just kind of crazy ideas. And that can be, you know, create a, a whole new pond. And so it reminds me of what you're doing where you're saying there's a certain class of founders that has been underestimated in Silicon Valley for the last forever. And that's the pond I'm going to fish in. And those are, that's unlocking a new talent pool. And I feel like the, you know, outsized returns from funds are always in cases where you're going somewhere else that someone is not looking currently. Yeah. I mean, to me, that was so blatantly obvious. And I did look at YC early days to compare. And I said, it's the same thing. It's just a different kind of group of people. It's the same logic. You can't say that there are no great companies or ideas coming from all the black people in tech. Like, (laughs) it doesn't make sense. So to completely, like, there's there's still today, but especially five years ago, there's still funds where you look at their portfolio and there's zero black founders in their portfolio, no matter what their business model is, there's zero black founders. Let's take it, you know, Justin, let's say, can you imagine a, a, a fund that has zero Asian founders? Does it make sense? You can imagine it because you've seen it, but no. does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, it's just like, it'd be like, um, saying I have a U.S. fund, but we're not going to take anything from New York for some reason. <laughs> like for some reason, we're just going to overlook that. Even though there, there's the logical, uh, the most basic fundamental logic tells you that there's probably talent there that you're overlooking. And there's a difference between being thematic and very specific and being myopic. Right. You can't, you have to, you know, to me that it, it, it's just, and so, yeah, I do, to be very clear, I I do have to take issue with a lot of what Paul Graham says. I know you all are very friendly and, and I wouldn't take away from that. But at the same time, you know, I talk to Sam Altman about this all the time. Paul is probably the first person who should say that it's okay for me not to like what he says. That's the whole point um, of his views, right? It's like, a, it's meta, but it's like, he should be championing my ability to dissent. But I did look at YC. I said, you know, what I studied early on, I didn't know much about Silicon Valley. But what I saw was it was almost like you were walking out around with your varsity jacket on if you came out of YC. People were like, I want to get in. I want to be part of that. I want to have that stamp. Yeah. That's what I wanted to create at Backstage. And now you look at pictures of us with 30, 60, 100 of our founders together out of, you know, we've invested in 150 or so companies, so maybe 300, 350 founders. And you see people going off and going on vacations together, or starting investor angel groups together. And it, people's like, we have a, at any given time, there are at least a thousand people in our queue to, to look at diligence. I, I dare say we're on our way <laughs> to, to having that, what I once imagined and dreamed of. That's amazing. So I'd love to learn, what have you learned from sourcing underestimated founders? 
I've just kind of confirmed what I what what I was thinking before, which is like, yeah, there's incredible talent. There was never a question, but it was like a confirmation there, an affirmation there. Like there's incredible untapped talent. I've also learned that in a way that is very special, I think people who are underestimated do not sit around and wait to be saved. So thinking about this more as like your competition, not letting your competition get away rather than like some sort of altruistic thing that you can invest in to save the planet. I think is the way that people should be thinking about this. I've seen people just by leaps and bounds go past who was their incumbent because they had been so underestimated for so long and they're not going to wait around for like the dozen funds, you know, the hundred funds in the country to deem them valuable and say, yes, we'll give you our money. They may give that a few months or a couple of years and say, okay, I'll play that game. But eventually, all the cream rises to the top, right? Eventually, people can't be bound. And so they're just like, I'm going to figure out another way. I give you like an example is like a Don Dixon who just made history by being the first black person, not even black woman, but the first black person to raise a million point seven, a million point oh seven and a, a reg C, I think it's reg C or reg D, crowdfunding equity. Hmm. And she did this like a year and a half ago. She comes back and she does it again, <laughs> uh, does it another million. And now she's raising like, I don't know, five million or something. And it's all because, and I can I say this because you said it publicly, you know, it's all because she's just very frustrated with that old guard and with the people who right now have, who seem to have the power when it comes to investing. And so I've seen that. I've seen it just in so many different ways. So there's so much going on behind the scenes with our portfolio alone and that and our portfolio doesn't even represent all of the underrepresented founders of course it's just a it's just a piece of it there's so much happening right now that is just going to blow people's minds over the next couple of years to be overlooking that and ignoring that is just to your detriment as an investor it's just inc- completely ridiculous it sounds like the You've seen a lot of resilience in the talent pool of the people that you're investing in. Yeah, resilience, but also resilience feels like, okay, I'm surviving something. I'm talking about people who are going to blow you out the water. You're not going to see them coming. <laughs> like, yeah. this is competition. Yeah, it's just like outsized. Like, because they've been held down so long, they're just like, <laughs> like the Incredible Hulk. They're just like, I'm going to break out of this and we're going to do, do 10 times what we thought we could. One thing that struck me when I was thinking about you and and this interview was, and your career in venture is that it is probably really aided by your open and curious mindset about people. When I was listening to the book, that came through a lot. You know, you were always interested in sitting down with people and learning uh, from them and meeting new people. And it made me think about how we met, which was, Mm -hmm. I think I tweeted something on the 4th of July a couple of years ago that people didn't interpret particularly charitably. I can't even remember what it was, to be honest, but something about founding of America. And a lot of people were taking the opportunity, as one does on Twitter, unfortunately, to just like be like, Justin's out of touch. He fucking doesn't know anything. And they're just dunking on me. And you reached out and were basically said, hey, here's how you're, what you're saying might be, is interpreted. And this is like why people may be upset. And if you want to have a discussion about that, you know, I'd love to talk to you. And mm-hmm. I thought that was a very obviously ref- refreshing and human way to approach. And so I was just reminded of that when I, we were talking and, and I was preparing for this. And I wanted to learn more about your philosophy when it comes to being open and curious with other people and, mm. and where that comes from. Yeah, I've always, when I was um, five or so on the playground at Lake Highlands Elementary in Dallas, Texas, Every time we'd go to the playground, I would just lean against a cement kind of structure and I would just watch everybody. And I would truly say to myself, first of all, I was just tripped out that you could think to yourself and nobody could hear it. That's the first thing. (laughs) And then I would say to myself, I wonder how Brad is doing at home. Or I wonder how Shamika feels about somebody pulling her hair at lunch or, you know, and I would just go through, I just watch it and I'm sure it looked pretty creepy. <laughs> I think about <laughs> it, but I would just like observe people and I was just so concerned and struck by people and what they w- might be thinking internally. So just like I had figured out, like you can think to yourself and nobody hears at five, 
I was also like, what are they thinking to themselves? And is, are they saying out loud what they really feel? It was just, it's just, I don't know where it came from. It just was innate. Like it just, I've always felt like there's just a deep connection to people. Now I'm very like misanthropic in a lot of ways. So like I, <laughs> I definitely, uh, like I don't like to be talked to in a, in a lift, <laughs> you know, like I don't like to be talked to on a, on a flight or anything like that. But I, so I, I deeply care about people though. And people, certainly strangers and, and people from all over. I've always, when I was in third grade, I wore uh, six watches so that I could know what time it was in different countries, in different time zones. Once I learned about that, I just always been like super hyper connected to people. And then when it comes to like now, you know, 40 this year and um, October 30th. Happy birthday. Thank you. Congratulations. That's a big milestone. Yeah. And, I just feel like, man, you know, unless uh, Peter Till has some plans for us, <laughs> as tongue in cheek, because he and I the also blood have transfuser. Issues. Yes, exactly. Unless he has <laughs> some big plans for all of us, I probably have what forty, sixty years left, and that is not a lot of time. And yes, the the country in the world, but especially the country, is like a, a trash fire. Of course, right now. <laughs> 2020 is not Yeah, 2020 is off the chain. But it's just like what's been happening in the world and the country has never stopped me from wanting to care about people and wanting to learn more about people. And I've just been just like insatiably curious my whole life. And the people that I kind of look to as interesting people uh, are the same. That's why every single day, no matter how busy I am, no matter how much is on my plate, no matter how much... You know, we're trying to figure out how to pay for payroll or any of that. No matter how much of that is going on, I'm like, I have to find time today to read. I have to find time today to catch up on trades. I have to find time today to listen to a podcast. I have to, even if it's like the very last thing I do today, every single day. It's just a curiosity I can't ever satisfy. And that's good. And also, I think my mother taught me early on because she was born in 1949 in Jackson, Mississippi six years before Emmett Till was murdered. And she grew up with people calling her all kinds of names and she had a curfew and she had different water fountains and she had dogs sicked on her when she was trying to march as a teenager for voting rights and all sorts of things, right? And she's had unfortunate, really personal things happen at the hands of, you know, white people. And she taught me so early. She's like, you don't judge people by what they look like. In any way, you don't judge people by their race, by their bank account, by their abilities or disabilities. You don't judge people by any of that. You don't judge people by accents. You don't judge, you know, she taught me that so early and so often yeah. that it was just like, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. And anybody who doesn't do that, they're the ones who we should be like saying, are they Okay. Like races, like Toni Morrison said that races are have a disease and they, they should be treated for it, but it's not necessarily her, her job to be the doctor. I look <laughs> at it like it's just your life is so short and we're so fortunate to be alive during this time and to have access that we have. Even Even the most underprivileged people in this country are more privileged than a lot of other countries. And to just not take advantage of being able to talk to people. Like we can talk to people, we can talk to each other through space, Justin. We're talking through space right now. Yep. <laughs> because space and time because of technology. It's just, uh, I would have it no other way. Amazing. That's, that's a beautiful thought. I love that. A couple final things I wanted to touch on. Uh, one is, so you set out when you started backstage, you were like, we're going to invest in a hundred companies by underrepresented founders in five years. And you blew through that goal. You just said 150. Yeah. And so what is the next phase for you? You know, you, in a way for, I mean, just drawing on my own experience, you know, I went through this, I remember when I started off, I was like, if I could just make a million dollars in tech, I'd be like set, that'd be my dream. And I did more than I'd ever accomplish. And then, you know, somewhere along the, the way I did that and, and a lot more, you know, the goal was never... This, this, the quenching of, of thirst for me, it wasn't satisfying to me. It was like, okay, I did that. Now what? And I was always about something next, probably in an unhealthy way, but definitely in an unhealthy way at times. So I'm curious for you, what is it, you know, you achieve your goal. You probably, maybe you always knew that this was going to happen um, at, at some way or another. I think you, 
it really does seem from the outside, like you, you kind of blew it out of the water. So now what is next for you? Yeah. I mean, everything like most things or like most things, it it may appear that way. Uh, For me, I think (laughs) I'm definitely excited and thrilled and proud of, yes, very proud of the fact that we are at uh, 150 companies just simply because we see so much and we invest in about 2% of what we see. So it's never been a, the 100 companies was never this vanity marker for me. It was always a, people are saying to me left and right that these founders don't exist. And if they do exist, they're not viable investments for venture and they're just wrong. And so I'm going to, in fact, they're so wrong, I'm going to invest in 100 by 2020. And I just knew it. So it's never been about that, about the, like the quantity, but we do see so much. So I think there, I don't know exactly what's going to happen next. I know that I, I am having just the greatest time ever with backstagecrowd.com, which is our syndicate. Yeah. It is, you know, if anybody's familiar with AngelList or anything like that, or even the rolling funds that Sahil and others are doing, this is just our take on it. We're using the same back office that they would have used in the past, but we're we're doing it all in-house. And Backstage Crowd, we've done seven or eight deals, more than a million dollars raised in, in less than four months or so. And... It is just kind of changing the dynamic. We don't, we no longer have to chase a large fund, for instance, because we can do volume and we can invest five to $10 million a year with the syndicate, which, if you put that over a five year investment period, is a 25 to $50 million fund, essentially. And, and that's only growing. So we have about a thousand accredited investors on there and another thousand non accredited investors. So anybody can sign up at backstagecrowd.com. Anybody can join. You, you say which one you are or if, or if you're not sure and you get an automated email that tells you what to do next and you're just in our deals. And like someone just tweeted earlier this year that they were like, um, you know, I just invested in my fifth black founder through the syndicate. And I wouldn't have had access. The founders wouldn't have necessarily let me into the deal. And I wouldn't have seen the deal if it hadn't been for the syndicate. So things like that, I think that are like crowd-based and are kind of more democratic, I think, I think is the term I'm looking for. I think that is going to be the future. I also feel and know that between 40 and 50 is when I'll make the majority of my wealth. I don't know exactly what that'll be. I don't have a goal for it, but I can imagine it'll be in the tens of millions. And that'll be what I use to then disperse for the rest of my life in different ways and kind of catalyze other things. Because no matter how much I make personally, it's never going to be enough to do all the things that we want to do. So like it's going to be that that spark and that catalyst for to be able to to get going. And yeah, I just I feel like the backstage portfolio is just going to continue to shine and I'm going to look back one day and just just look around. I'm going to see like this IPO and that person investing in someone else and this other person getting their millionth customer. And this it's just going to be like all the fruits of this labor are going to come true. I still, I mean, make no mistake here, we still struggle when it comes to expenses. We still struggle when it comes to like paying our bills and we've raised... I've raised $12 million and half of that Mark Cuban put in. And yes, that's amazing when you go from being homeless to raising $12 million in five years. But if you think about what we're up against, $130 billion was deployed and or raised, depending on who you ask, in 2018 for venture. $250 million of that, 0.002 or something like that, went to black women. So the, the last bird round, the bird scoot around, was deployed into all black women across the country in venture. So we have a long way to go in the grand scheme of things. And then backstage itself, I I very much so think that the crowd and other things are going to really push that. I also think there are going to be some of these um, really outsized exits that are going to be what part of what generates that wealth. And they will inspire, uh, as will other amplification, like media, television shows, movies, podcasts, all the things that I'm working on, they will all inspire people to start companies. And that eventually leads to generational wealth, in my opinion. So all of that is what's like floating through my head, (laughs) right? When you ask that question. I love that. 
it's um, amazing how much, you know, a little capital and time and effort can go in the beginning of something, you know, can generate some of these stories and inspire like so much more that happens down the road, you know, five, 10 years later in terms of like, if that company becomes successful and that founder is an example, then other people want to do it. It inspires other founders and more capital. Is I mean, attractive. absolutely. I mean, you're, you're, you're an example yourself. Think about Justin TV. Think about Twitch. Think about YC itself. There's just no question that you start. I mean, I think what YC started with like, I don't know, 12,000, 15,000 or something. Yeah, some it was chili like on Tuesdays. $12,000. $12, we got $12,000. We got seven chili meals yep. that Paul cooked himself. See? And there were six com eight companies in that very first cohort of companies. Yeah. So that's that's it. And you think about the billionaires and the millionaires who have been created from that spark 15 years ago. We're in year five. So can, yeah. you can imagine why I look at this next decade with such awe and, and, and so excited and so, so happy about what the foundation has been built. I love that. Okay. One final thing I want to touch on, because it's very personal for me too, is um, in, the, in your book, you talk about being sober, quitting mm -hmm. drinking. And that's something I did as well for myself about a year and a half ago now. Awesome. And I was always somebody who people on the podcast have, have heard about. I was, I was someone who drank a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot, a lot, and you know, all through my whole life. And I never imagined that I, I would quit. I love to like give this example to people because I think that when I was drinking, I didn't see another way to be, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. so I'd love for, for you to talk a little bit about that. And then maybe, you know, that was one thing that you did for yourself for a, a while ago. Like what are some of the other personal growth things that you, you, you kind of doing for yourself now? Yeah, it was uh, about it was uh 2017. I don't know the exact date cuz I part of being sober is like not being too precious about it because that then I think it becomes more of like this sort of stamp on you and then it just you think about it too much. That's just how I feel yeah. personally, personally, you know. So, but I was two thousand it was summer 2017 and I would have been 20 I mean sorry, 36 at the time and and had been drinking since 21. I actually like, you know, I had a couple squigs of alcohol as a teenager, just at home, you know, but I, I yeah. was dead set as a teenager of never drinking. Like I was so upset because I just had seen family members, extended family members drunk a lot and I just hated it. It, it really upset me. So I was like, I'm never going to drink. And then I went to Europe and <laughs> um, like at 21, I, I went to Germany and uh, was introduced to alcohol. So that changed. All plans out the window. Yeah. So from 21 to 36, with the exception of one year that I was able to go sober, a very, very difficult year, I drank every single day of my life at least, at least five servings, if not, you know, I mean, I used to, in my 20s, I would just kill a like a, a fifth. I would kill yeah. it, unfortunately. And so I too never thought, I never in a million years thought I could kick it. And right before I quit that first time in my late 20s or like mid to late 20s, it was because I was just drinking by myself at home constantly and trying to get away from things, you know, when you're broke and all these different, I was trying to get away from things, but I was drinking. So I had to drink to go to the grocery store. I couldn't face people. So I remember I had a grocery store across from me in Sherman Oaks. It was across, right across the little road there and I always walked to it. And I just had to take shots in order to even go to the grocery store. And I was like, this is going to kill me. I'm going to, I'm going to like die in my sleep. You know, this sucks. And so I, I had this uh, rock bottom moment in my late twenties uh, that I'd never talk about, but I, you know, won't say the details, but I had a rock bottom moment. And so I locked myself in this place I was staying for like a week and I got DVDs and I just went on detox alone, which I don't recommend, like see a doctor um, if you're going to do something like that, because it is dangerous to do that. But I stopped drinking for like a year. And every single time I would pass a bar or somebody else was drinking in front of me, I would just long for the alcohol and long for yeah. the feeling. And it was just terrible. So after a year, I was very proud of myself for doing it. But after a year, I, I started drinking again because I was like, love Lauren or something's happened. <laughs> I started drinking again. <laughs> And like within five days, I was back to daily hangovers and daily drinking till I passed out and just super high functioning though. Like I did, I'm just, you know, I was able to do so much while drunk. So nobody really knew I had a problem. Then you fast forward to 36 
and I have the fund. I'm like a, a year and a half into the fund. I actually have it. And I'm super high functioning. I'm doing what I need to do. But I'm also making myself sick at, at five o'clock every single day. I'm starting to drink and I'm just making myself sick. I'm waking up at nine, 10 a.m. in a world where you have to like in the West Coast, you need to be awake by like six or seven to really jump into things. I don't know. It's just really silly. So I said, OK, I'm going to probably have to go to rehab because it's so important that I quit, but I can't quit it by myself. So I'm going to have to go to rehab. It's going to be expensive, but I can probably afford it now. And it's going to take away, it's going to be a distraction, but I'm not going to lie about it. I'm going to go to rehab. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go to rehab, but let me do one more thing before I do that. Just because it's such a, like a big deal to go to rehab. I said, let me just go to um, Amazon and look for some audiobooks. We were talking about that earlier, right? Let me look yeah. for some audiobooks and see if there's like, because I had attempted to have like hypnotism, uh, be hypnotized for it. That never worked or anything. So yeah. I said, let me find a book and see if there's any anything that has like great recommendations that just I can't deny that it's worked for other people. Because what will hurt if it, this is an alternative? So I was scrolling through and I found this book called This Naked Mind. And I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's by a woman. Um, I'm, unfortunately, her name is I'm, I'm skipping her name right now because that happens sometimes. I'm 40, y'all. But um <laughs> I found it and it just had these incredible reviews. A lot of people were saying, you know, if there was a bad review, it was like, this is uh, so derivative. You know, <laughs> like, I was like, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, so anybody can to say me. that. Like, okay, everything <laughs> is derivative because <laughs> we're running out of things. But everybody else was like, I read it or I listened to it and I have stopped drinking. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. Do this during the weekend because I'm real smart. <laughs> during the weekend of WeHo Pride. So gay pride you know, in WeHo, yep. which is like, I don't know if you've ever been there before, but there's alcohol present. I'll just say it. Like <laughs> <laughs> so I decided, okay, I'm going to do it. So the first thing it says in the book is you can still drink while you read this book. And I was like, oh, she sold, sold. Cool. <laughs> They're not going to judge me. So cool. So I'm drinking. I go to the WeHo Pride. I get drunk, wasted there. And I'm never like sloppy. I don't do sloppy drunk, but I was just drunk, just out of my mind drunk. Four or five days into the book and I complete it. Yeah, because it's on audio and it's read by a woman and I complete it. And I go to like reach at like 5 p.m. on like a Tuesday. I go to reach for my Tito's, which is what I was drinking at the time. A bottle, mm -hmm. I had a, like a row of bottles that were in my place. I went to reach for it so I could sit down and watch Mad Al, as you do. And I was like, huh, I don't want to drink this. That's so weird. I drink this every single day of my life. I don't want to drink it right now. I was like, oh, that book probably hypnotized me. It's going to go away. I'll, it'll go away. So I close it. And I'm like, okay, for a day, I'm not going to drink. No big deal. Second day, I go back. I reach for it. I don't want to drink it. And usually when I, after I've had a particularly bad hangover, I will take all the alcohol in my house and just pour it down the sink and yell at it and scream and say, and, and yell at myself. And why would you do this to yourself? I just... I was just like, no, I'm going to put it back in the thing. I don't, it's fine. I haven't touched a drink since. That's, That's three, three plus years ago. And the difference between that and the one year that I was sober is that I don't care about alcohol. People, you could be drinking, I mean, not you, but someone else could be drinking in front of me. And I, I'd be like, okay, cool. I'm glad you're drinking that. I don't like it. So that's for you. And it's just such a freedom that I never imagined. I Sometimes I'll talk to my wife and I just out of nowhere, I'll be like, can you believe I'm not drinking? And she's yeah. like, because she knew me for the first half of our relationship, the three years prior, she knew me as a drinker. Mm -hmm. And it, it caused a lot of issues for us. Thankfully, I was never, you know, I never went too far with it. But like I would, I would be real short with her or, you know, it would ruin nights or something. But she was just like... I told her, I said, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be together if I was still drinking. She's like, yeah, you're probably right. I don't know if I would have been able to stay with you like this, you know? And it's just a beautiful freedom. And I yeah. love it. And it's it's the main thing I think about when I think about self-care. The rest of the self-care that you asked was is mainly boundaries. I do a lot <laughs> in a given day and in a given week and a given year. And... A friend of mine says I do more before noon than most people do in a week. I do a lot and I give a lot and it's okay to say that and it's okay to know that and you can't do everything for everybody and be everything for everybody. And so um, my boundaries today are much better than they've ever been. 
and it's about time. It's about like, it's about damn time. Even some could say <laughs> available on it's about damn time.com. Thank you. Uh, but it's about like having control of wh- what you do, what you say yes to, what you say no to. Ultimately it has to be up to you and you're going to disappoint people and people are going to feel like, you know, some people might even say, Oh, you've changed or all you this, but you know what you do. You know what your intentions are. You know the impact you have. And so that the boundaries is like the biggest thing I can say. Right, right behind uh, if you feel like drinking is taking over your life and is controlling you more than you're controlling it, I would say try to get some help. This Naked Mind is a great test. You know, who knows? If it doesn't work, what did you lose a couple of days? But if it does work, like it has worked for so many people who have told about it, what could that mean for you? Right behind that, I would say boundaries. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, that was everything that I wanted to cover. Any other final thoughts or words to the audience? Yeah, I would say come listen to Justin's interview with me on Your First Million, the podcast that I have. Uh, so that's Your First Million, where we talk to a lot of interesting people, including Justin. There's the book, It's About Damn Time. And then I definitely invite anybody who's been interested in investing or who already does to go to backstagecrowd.com because uh, – that's where you're going to find me mostly. That's we, we're, we're doing the work over there. Awesome. Arlen, thanks a ton for joining me. Yeah. This was a fun conversation. I loved it. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. And it's one of your first guests. This is really cool. All right. That was my conversation with my friend Arlen. I hope you found it as inspirational as I did. If you want to find more about her firm, Backstage Capital, you can check her out at backstagecapital.com. And follow her on Twitter at Arlen was here. That's A R L A N was here. And if you like the podcast, bang out a five star rating on iTunes. And if you have feedback, please hit me up at Justin Khan on Twitter. And I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>